Hey everyone, Aisha here. And so I wanted to talk to you today about the topic, the Lord is faithful, the Lord is good. And so today I'm actually going to be studying, I'm going to be doing a study on Isaiah 33 verses one through six. And um, it, it is so much good stuff in here. So it starts off by saying, ah, you destroyer, you uh, who yourself have not been destroyed. You traitor whom none has betrayed. When you have ceased to destroy, you will be destroyed. And when you have been finished betraying, they will betray you. O oh Lord, be gracious to us. We wait for you. Be our arm every morning, our salvation in times of trouble. As the tumultuous noise, people flee. When you lift yourself up, nations are scattered. And your spoil is gathered as the caterpillar gathers. As locusts leap, it is left upon the Lord is exalted for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with justice and righteousness and he will be the stability of your times. Abundance of salvation, wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. And so <laughs> this section is so good. And I know you might be thinking at first glance like, okay, so. So where are we going with this? It starts off with this whole destroyer thing, traitor thing, and then it just moves on to, you know, the Lord is good, right? And so I thought this passage was so fascinating as I was studying it, and I could not wait to just teach this to you today. And so verse one, what it says is that um, all you destroyer, you who yourself who have not been destroyed. Who you traitor whom none has betrayed. When you have ceased to, detro to destroy, you will be destroyed. And when you have finished betraying, they will betray you. And I think that this is a powerful verse because what it shows you in verse one, and that was just verse one, is that evil does not go unpub uh, unpunished. The adversary in this passage has never been destroyed nor betrayed, but because of their actions of violence, they will both be destroyed and betray betrayed. Evil only lasts so long before people who pro, uh, provide promote evil and people who do evil are caught in their own trares, traps and snares. And we see this actually in, what scripture is that? Um, Psalm, okay, I didn't write this one down. It is in Psalms, Psalm, what is it? Ah. Where is it? Hopefully, I remember it very quickly because I do not. I wanted to. I think it's 30 something. Ugh, why is it not coming to my remembrance right now? Holy Spirit, bring this back to my remembrance. I did not think to share this with you when I prepared the lesson. Okay, 35. Psalm 35. It's uh, Psalm 35 talks about. Is it in Psalm 35? Okay, Psalm 35 says, if you go to verse four, it says, let them be put to shame and dishonor who seek after my life. Let them be turned back and disappointed who devise evil at, at, at evil against me. Let them be as chafe before the wind with the angel of the Lord driving them away. Let their way be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. Okay, is this the one I wanted or maybe it's Psalm 18. Because what I wanted to say is they would be um, be caught in their own snares. That was the one that I was looking for. Um, okay, I might not be able to find it right now. But what I was looking for is let them be the one where it talks about in their own snares. Okay, but I don't want to continue to... Is it Psalm 18? No, it's not Psalm 18. Okay, whatever it is, I'm not remembering it right now. But if I remember it, I will read it to you. But there's a verse in, in somewhere in Psalms where it talks about on the people who devise evil, they're going to be caught in their own snares and traps. And this is effectively what this is. Eventually, it might not, it might look like people who, who do evil are going unpunished, but eventually that evil will catch up to them. And so it's not that you wish evil on anyone. It just kind of, the Lord is, is a just God and nothing goes unpunished. 
And so I think that that can be a sense of comfort because the Bible also says that vengeance is mine, says saith the Lord. And so I think that sometimes we can get caught in this trap of unforgiveness, hurt, and pain. And if you can become unable to move forward because we don't know how to process some of the things that happen to us, but we can take comfort in the fact that the Lord is the one who defends us. The Lord is a just God. And even though, um, and a matter of fact, one of the psalmists even said that he looked around somewhere near Psalm 76, somewhere like that. He says that as he looks around, he see it looks like the unrighteous and the wicked are winning. But at the end of the psalm, he comes to the conclusion that the Lord is a just God and that they will all they will ultimately be punished. And so, like I said, we don't wish ill on anybody, but I hope this is a uh, some comfort to you. If you are going through something right now, you're looking like, you know what? I don't know what's going on. Things just seem to be spiraling out of control. Things don't seem to be right, but trust in the Lord that he has got your back. He is the one who knows the beginning from the end and justice is his, right? Justice is his. And so starting in verse two, what we see is very interesting. Um, from there, the Lord talks about how the unrighteous are not going to go unpunished. But then what it does is it moves down to the people of Israel crying out for the Lord. And they say, oh Lord, be gracious to us. We wait for you. Be our arm every morning, our salvation in times of trouble. As a tumultuous noise, people flee. And when you lift yourself up, the nations are scattered. And your spoil is gathered as the caterpillar gathers, as the locust leaf and it is left upon. And so in verse two, we begin to see the focus shift to the people calling out to the Lord for help. And if you read Isaiah um, in its full context, what you see is the people of God not turning to God. They are in a state of rebellion. They're in a state of wickedness, and they have completely turned their backs on the Lord. As a matter of fact, the Assyrian army is coming up against them. So they have adversaries coming up against them. They had... Um, you know, they had other like adversaries, regional adversaries coming up against them. But instead of turning to the Lord, they trusted in their own military might and they trusted in the military might of Egypt, who at the time was like the top military power of the ancient Middle East. And so they went to Egypt to seek help and to seek um, an alliance to be able to have them, someone defend them. And so, in the, um, and so in the book of Isaiah, you know, the Lord is just like, come to me. I am the sovereign God. I know all. I am the one who raises up kings and destroys kings. I am the one who has the power of all creation. Come to me. Don't trust in your military might. Don't trust in your knowledge. Don't trust in what you can see. Come to the Lord. But the people of Israel didn't do that. They went to Egypt instead. And then in the battle, you know, Egypt kind of gets destroyed. Like, it's just it's a whole mess. But um, so Egypt wasn't there for them like they thought that they would be. And so this is really interesting that in verse two, where what you see is a shift. It's just like, okay, the Lord is going to destroy the enemies. But you know what? We can call on the Lord. So it's like in their distress, they finally decided to call on the Lord for help. And and then in this, they also declare their dependence on them, on him, which they had not been doing previously. And in this, they express how they will wait for him. See, in verse two, it says, we, in verse two, it says, oh Lord, be gracious to us. We will wait for you. Prior to that, they had been living in a state of unrepentant wickedness. And finally, because they had enemies at their doorstep, because things just seemed to be out of control and crazy, they turn to the Lord and say, oh, Lord, we are going to wait for you. So now in verse two, which is about in the, uh, Isaiah 33 is about halfway through the book of Isaiah. They turn, they change and say, you know what? We're going to wait for you. And they express their dependence on him. And then it shifts to the Lord's power. So then we get to... Um, so we're, they're talking about waiting for them. So that's verse two. And then you see that, and then they're talking about their dependence on him, be our arm every morning and our salvation in times of trouble. And then in verse three, you see it shift to the Lord's power. 
And there is an expectation of deliverance and rescue when the Lord shows up because of his power and might, which is a part of his character. Because we know in terms of God's character that he is trustworthy. He is almighty. He is sovereign. He's omnipotent, omniscient. He knows all. He is everything. He's the beginning and the end. And you begin to see the people of Israel recognize the power of God. And so... And there's, and because of the power of God, they have this expectation of deliverance and rescue when the Lord shows up. And so, because that's part of his character. And so the people know that when the Lord shows up, that their enemies will be destroyed. And so it says that at your tumultuous noise, people flee. You lift yourself up and nations are scattered, scattered and your spoil is gathered as the caterpillar gathers and locusts and as locusts leap, it is left upon. And then in verse five, it really begins to shift again to high praise and worship and the character of God and who he is. And so before what they were doing is, like I said, it started off with the enemies. Eventually it's being predicted that their enemies are going to fall. But then you see that the people of Israel finally move to begin to have their dependence on the Lord and they're recognizing his power and why they can put their dependence on the Lord. And then they said, you know what? The battle that we see right now, kind of like this Red Sea moment, right? In Exodus 14, 14. The, the Egyptians we see right now, you'll never see again because they recognize that when the Lord shows up, they will be delivered. They will be saved. And this is their expectation. This is their hope. This is their thing that they're anchoring themselves on in this moment. You see why this is good, right? Because some of you guys are sitting there like waiting on the Lord. Like, you know what, Lord, I need you to save me. And you can feel confident that you can trust in him because of his character, who he is and his might. And you know that he has the power to save because that is who he is. He is God, right? And so we see that they're going into high praise because of the expectation that they have that the Lord is going to save them. It says the Lord is exalted for he dwells on high. He will feel Zion with justice and righteousness, and he will be the stability of our times, abundance of salvation, wisdom and knowledge and fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. And so they're like, look, we have this expectation that we've already said that he's going to save us. And this is going to be what it's like once he saves. And this is so fascinating to me because now you see them lifting up the name of the Lord. They're exalting the name of the Lord. And interestingly, interesting interestingly they praise the lord for filling zion with justice and righteousness whereas before they rejected justice and righteousness and instead they chose unrighteousness and oppression of others and see this is like a fascinating shift to me because they are they had been like and you really have to read like all of isaiah to kind of get to this point because in isaiah 32 i mean isaiah 33 verses 1 through 6 in isaiah 32 the lord and 30 um 31 the lord is pronouncing judgment on the people of israel because of their unrighteousness and so for them to make this dramatic shift in isaiah 33 it's because they had an encounter with the Lord. They turned back to the Lord. Their hearts are repentant. They're turning back to back home. They're coming back home when they have fled the um, when they have fled the Lord, because what it says before in Isaiah thirty two verse um, actually verse six it says for this fool speaks folly and his heart is busy with iniquity to practice ungodliness to utter error concerning the Lord to leave the craving of the hungry unsatisfied to deprive the thirsty of drink. As for the scoundrel, his devices are evil. He plans wicked schemes to ruin the poor with lying words, even when the plea of the needy is right. But he who is noble plans noble things, and on noble things he stands. And so then later on in Isaiah go in 32, it goes on to talk about how the why the, um, just the destruction that is going to be coming. And so you begin to see that things weren't really going well for the people of Israel. They were not following God. And so for them to turn back and have this high praise is a powerful 
change of heart because they had rejected righteousness. They had rejected justice. I just read from Isaiah 32 about how they were oppressing the poor and treating people poorly. They were lying on people, sending them to jail falsely so that they can get the upper hand. See, that was the type of thing that was going on and that was grieving the heart of the Lord. But because the Lord loves his children, he sent discipline to them. He sent discipline to them. And one other thing that I wanted to say is that the, so the Lord disciplined them and it led them to cry out for mercy. It led them to cry out for mercy. The Lord wasn't trying to destroy them. He was trying to bring them back home. Like a good parent parents a child who was going wayward in the attempt to reroute their steps. To get them to come back to a path of goodness. And so in this discipline, the very thing that the people of Israel rejected. They rejected justice and righteousness. And the the country was unstable because of the wickedness that was going through there they now desire stability they now recognize that only the lord provides and prior to that the people were searching for their hope peace rescue and deliverance from egypt another human right a military power that looks good on paper but could not save them could not save them so i want to ask you what are you looking for that cannot save you. And so they were looking for human strength, might, and wisdom. And then what we see in verse 6, which is why it's so powerful, they realize that the Lord is their stability. The Lord is their abundance of salvation, their wisdom, their knowledge, and the fear of the Lord is what they need. The fear of the Lord is what they need. And so at this point, the people are crying out to the Lord for salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. Prior to that, they sought human wisdom, knowledge, and the knowledge of the Egyptians. And the wisdom and knowledge of fools, which is what led to the destruction and oppression that they were experiencing at that time. While the knowledge of the Lord leads to deliverance and salvation, peace and stability, this shows that the reason... My Proverbs 3 and 5, 8 implores us to trust in the Lord with all of our heart, right? Let me read this real quick. Um, Proverbs 3. Let me flip to Proverbs 3 real quick. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your path. And I love this because I like to go past three and five and six and go to be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It would be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. And what we see in Isaiah, what was going on here is that people were trusting in their own strength. People weren't trusting in the Lord with their heart. They were leaning on their understanding. They were leaning on the understanding of other people. They did not acknowledge the Lord. And their past became confused. Their past became hard. Their past became difficult. They were wise in their own eyes. They did not fear the Lord. They did not love the Lord. They did not acknowledge the Lord. They did not turn away from evil. And because of it, they did not have healing to their flesh and refreshment to their bones. They had oppression. They had strife. They had worry. They had fear. But once they decided to start to turn back to the Lord, speak high praises of the Lord, exalt the Lord, then they began to recognize the beauty of the salvation that the Lord brings. So we need to trust in the Lord for he is our salvation. He is our strength. He is our peace. It can be tempting to trust in human might. Because of what we can see. The second Corinthians 4, 18 tells us to place our focus on the unseen and not the seen. Because the unseen is eternal, but the, un but the seen is temporary. And so too often we place our attention, we place our focus on the things that are seen. The things that are temporal. The things that are fleeting. And we miss out on the anchor and the stability and the beauty of the eternal, which is God. And so Hosea says, my people are destroyed by lack of knowledge. But I want to let you know that this isn't just any knowledge. It's the knowledge of the Lord. Because human knowledge is folly and it leads 
to foolishness and ultimately destruction. But praise God that he doesn't care. He doesn't leave us in our foolishness and mess. He rescues us. And sometimes this rescue comes in the form of lovingly disciplining us. And it sucks, right? It sucks when that discipline comes. But it's there to get us back on track because he loves us. He loves us too much to allow us to just walk down the path of darkness. Like we see with the prodigal son. The prodigal son left his father, chose the path of unrighteousness, and ended up in a pigsty. A pigsty. But the father loved him enough to allow him to end up in the pigsty. So he can have this contrast between the pigsty and home because he knew that his son, once he saw what was on the other side, that the father wasn't trying to keep anything from him, but he was trying to protect him by keeping him within a hedge of protection for his own safety and security. And some of us need to recognize that that is what God is doing to us. He's not keeping things from us. He's not hurting us. He's not trying to, you know, like oppress us or anything like that. He loves us and he's trying to save us from ourselves because in our own strength, because of the fall of Adam and Eve, our hearts are bent towards wickedness. Jeremiah says our hearts are desperately wicked and who can know that? Right. And so God, when he disciplines us, it's not meant for our destruction. It's meant for our correction. It's meant to turn our hearts, minds, souls and my hearts, minds and souls back to him as our father, as our Abba, as our savior, as the love of our life, because he, he is a loving God, but he is also a jealous God. And he will tear down the idols of our hearts and lives. Because he knows that nothing can fulfill us the way he can. Seeking joy and fulfillment in idols will only lead to destruction. And so therefore, I want to ask you, what are you trusting in? Are you trusting in human knowledge or God's knowledge? Are you trusting in God's strength or your strength or someone else's strength, right? Right? Where is your heart? Is your heart submitted to God? Or is it a heart chasing idols? And an idol is anything that you put above God. Do you have a heart for biblical justice? Do you have a heart for caring for the poor? Do you have a heart for doing what's right, good, and honorable? Or do you have a heart of oppression? Do you love God? Do you love what God loves? Do you love what God loves? And do you hate what God hates? Or are you being are you being molded into the image and likeness of Jesus? Or are you being conformed to the world? The Bible says, be not conformed to the world. And so where is God in your life? Is he first? Is he last? Um, do you seek him after all of your options, after you're out of all your options and all your ideas didn't work? How do you treat others? Do you those who Do you treat people who, how do you treat people who can't do anything for you, right? People who can't give back or you can't get anything in return. How do you treat the neediest people? Those who, because these are important questions to ask. How do you love others? Because those who do evil are always going to be caught in their own snares and traps that they leave for other people. On this side of eternity or the next. For God judges all. The works of wickedness will not go unpunished. And unless somebody, unless the person repents and submits their lives to Jesus Christ, they will not be spending their lives and spending their lives in eternity in heaven. They will be spending their entire, their lives in eternity, burning in the hot flames of hell. And so this is why I urge you not to wait until the discipline of the Lord comes to change your ways, because no one knows how long we're going to be alive, to be honest. And who wants to go through that, right? Who wants to go through crappy, hard times in order to get the lesson, right? It doesn't feel good. And honestly, one of my prayers for myself has been, Lord, don't let it take all that. Don't let it take all that for me to be able to follow you and for me to be able to listen to you and to obey you. I don't want to have to go through that to shift my focus and turn back to you. It shouldn't have to take all that. 
And I don't want it to have to take all that. So Lord, help me to be obedient to you. Because I know what it's like to have to be disciplined to put back on the right track. And it doesn't feel good at all. And so for me, my prayer for myself, just like my prayer for you, is Lord, purify my heart. And whenever I wander, help me to turn back to you. Let me to come willingly, surrendered, unlike you was when I had to go through workplace bullying to get me to be obedient to the Lord, dragging, kicking, and screaming, right? I literally was coming and dragging, kicking, and screaming into the will of God. But it was the workplace bullying. It was the affliction of workplace bullying that got me to get on the right path where I was obeying the Lord. And so I don't want to have to go through that. It doesn't feel good. And I don't want you to have to go through affliction and discipline in order to be on the right track. And so I pray that you go willingly, submit to the Lord, and live for the Lord in all your ways. And just live live for Christ. And so I want to also share with you my book. That was it for today. And so I want to share with you my book, Navigating the Impossible, a survival guide for single moms from pregnancy through their first year of motherhood. This is now available um, at navigatingtheimpossiblebook.com, navigatingtheimpossiblebook.com. Or it is available and it's also available on Amazon. So I encourage you to get your copy because this book is going to give you hope. Just like that we talked about how the people of Israel recognize the power of the Lord and they were able to exalt the Lord and praise the Lord because they realized that the Lord was their salvation. In this book, I talk about my story of navigating pregnancy as a single mom and being a single mom. So I talk about a critical time through pregnancy through the first year of motherhood in this book because this book is designed to point you back to the Father and to give you hope to know that you can trust in Him and that with Him, He will He will allow you to get through. And so there's something that I said in here that I want to see if I can find really quickly. I said that... Um, where is it? I want to talk about navigating. Okay. Um, so I talk about what I wanted to say here is that nothing is impossible with the Lord. I wanted to pull up the scripture, but, um, in here, the whole purpose of the book is to let you know that nothing is impossible with the Lord. Nothing is impossible with the Lord. And so it doesn't matter what you see around you. It doesn't matter if it seems like you have enemies camping out, right? It doesn't matter if it seems like things aren't going right in your life. Nothing is impossible with the Lord. And so I urge you to repent in the areas where you need to repent. Turn back to the Lord in the areas where you need to turn back to the Lord at. Grow your faith in the areas that you need to grow your faith in. And trust in the Lord that he is your, your salvation. He is your deliverer. He is your hope. He is your provider. He is your father. And so thank you so much for joining me here today. I encourage you to subscribe <laughs> and to also leave me some love. Leave me some comments to let me know how this has blessed you. Alrighty. See you next time.